I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Irving. Well, you've heard the expression, act locally and think globally. Well, today we're going to explore both of those terms, localization and globalization, something that affects each and every one of us every minute of our lives. My guest today is author, filmmaker, Helena Norberg-Hodge, a pioneer of the local economy movement. Through writing, and public lectures on three continents, she's been promoting an economics of personal and social and ecological well-being for more than 40 years. In fact, we talk about the economics of happiness. Helena is a widely respected analyst of the impact of the global economy and international development on local communities, local economies and personal identity and is a leading proponent of localization or decentralization as a means of countering those impacts. She is the founder and director of Local Futures and the International Alliance for Localization, the IAL, based in the United States, UK, with subsidiaries in Germany and here in Australia. In fact, I talked to Helena from Australia, Local Futures, examines the root causes of our current social and environmental crises, while promoting a more sustainable, equitable patterns of living in both North and South. Helena is also the founding member of the International Commission on the Future of Food and Agriculture, the International Forum on Globalization and the Global Eco Village Network. Helena's seminal books, and she's written a few, was Ancient Futures, Learning from the Ladakh, and it has been described as an inspirational classic, providing insightful solutions to the unintended impacts of development based on her decades living and working in Ladakh in India. Together with her film of the same title, it has been translated into more than 40 languages and sold about a half a million copies. Her most recent book, Local is Our Future, Steps to an Economic of happiness and economics of happiness outlines how a systemic economic shift from global to local can address the world's social, economical, ecological, and spiritual crises. It's been described as a must read for our time. Helena is also the producer and co director of the award winning film, The Economics of Happiness, which we discuss in this podcast, and also co author of Bringing the Food Economy Home from the ground up and and another book from the ground up rethinking industrial agriculture earth journal counted helena among the world's most 10 most interesting environmentalists while carl mcneil's book wisdom for the livable planet she was profiled as one of the eight visionaries changing the world i have been so looking forward to talking to helena and having her on as a guest i hope you enjoy this conversation i had with helena norberg hodge Welcome to the show, Helena. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Helena, there is so much you do. Uh, there are so many things you're involved in, and Local Futures is, is the main focus for your activities. I wondered if we might just start with Localization 101. What does that mean? Localization is essentially both a, a new economic paradigm, uh, which is arguing that we need to reject the dominant economic trajectory that we've been on for a very long time, which has been creating more and more dependence on global businesses while destroying local businesses and economies. And we need now instead to reverse that process to start supporting uh, more localized structures. And that means shortening the distance between production and consumption, particularly around basic needs like food, Um, But it also means adapting economic activity to particular ecosystems and places. So it's particularly important in primary production, food, fishery and forestry. We need rapidly a wake up about the absolute necessity 
of supporting local instead of global. Um, there's a lot more to say about it. Um, the, the path that our governments have ended up supporting and often out of just a blind belief that the only way to grow the economy is through more global trade. That path is actually responsible for most of our crises, whether climate, extinction of species, epidemics of you know, health epidemics, epidemics of depression, insecurity, poverty, etc. So it's, um, it's a very important issue, the need mm. to shift towards localizing instead of globalizing. I know that uh, often uh, the availability of seemingly cheap food is often held up as uh, globalization's greatest achievement. And we're going to talk about globalization too and how seemingly cheap it's not. But you were also involved in a, in a film called The Economics of Happiness. And there are two words that often don't find their way into the same sentence. I wondered if you might just tell us, because this is one of your latest uh, you know, things that you've been involved with. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, actually, I mean, the film, The Economics of Happiness, came out in 2011, oh my but God. it's still as relevant as yes. ever. And I have to say, ever since my work in the ancient Tibetan culture of Ladakh and Bhutan, I've been trying to raise awareness about happiness. And, and very often in the West, I would be, um, you know, I'd be told that well, happiness, you know, you can't measure it. And how do you know that people were happy? And for one thing, I've always tried to say, we all know the difference between when we feel happy and when we don't feel happy, when we feel sad or angry, we know the difference. And the difference is huge. And we also know now medically how important it is for our health, our general well-being, um, to have a happy state of mind. So, um, yeah, essentially, I saw this link between what's happening in the economic system out there and our inner personal well being. And again, you know, in, with the globalizing, large scale, speedy, competitive path, we were being taken away further and further from deep connection, both to family, to community, to our own place. And what was happening was we were being essentially tossed about like sort of little atoms uh, in, because of economic pressures. It's a very different thing to travel because we like to see other places and like to learn about other cultures. But the imposed mobility and speed and competition that the global economy has created is responsible for major health issues and mental, both mental and physical. So localization, again, is about reversing that, is about rebuilding more stable, more place-based, more community-based structures and economies. And we can see, we have evidence that it brings about greater health, both, both emotional and physical. Mm. I mean, the book, one of the books you've written and been involved is, is about that, an ancient future, learning from Ladakh. I wondered if you might share with us in a little more detail. You touched on it as an inspiration for the movie, but what were some of the lessons you, you learned from the, right, that book, from your well, experience there? From my experience, that's what it was. I arrived mm. in this place called Ladakh, which is West Tibet, part of Tibet that belongs politically to India. It had been sealed off from the outside world and was suddenly thrown open. I arrived there as part of a film team in the mid seventies. I was only gonna be there for six weeks, but fell in love with the place and people. I was a linguist, so I started working on the language and the spoken language hadn't been written down before. So it was very challenging, very interesting work. And in the process, I came to know the most sort of chilled out, relaxed, humorous, um, joyous people I had ever met and uh, and I was it's quite a big region about the size of Austria but with only a hundred thousand people in what was essentially a desert but as I went through the region I was collecting folk stories and doing work um, I was going to be doing a PhD on the language at that point but what I found was everywhere I went 
people never ever said, oh, we're so poor, we're so backward, can you help us? They said, oh, why don't you stay in the winter? The winters are wonderful because we don't have any work in the winter. Have you tasted all our different kinds of food? And, you know, actually by our measures, the foods were fairly limited, but basically people were deeply satisfied with their lives and had deep personal self-esteem. And I, you know, I witnessed then how the advent of a consumer culture pushed by advertising and also by tourism in a way, all of that imposed this sort of image of what you're supposed to be like and how you're supposed to be this urban westernized consumer to have any respect and to, have, to be considered important. And it gave the illusion that if you lived in that urban consumer way, you never worked, you had infinite amounts of money. So it was a very seductive um, image that particularly appealed to young children. And I saw how this led to a loss of self-esteem, how it led to also um, ultimately to conflict between local groups. So I've ever since that time in trying to raise awareness about the impact of this consumer culture economy on different parts of the world and, and what we can do to change it. Yes, well, I think one feature of globalization that it runs across the board is the uh, holding up of growth as the measure of a success of a government or a society. Um, this is, uh, we're being encouraged always at every level to be good consumers, not good citizens. I mean, what uh, are there any benefits to globalization? Before we lob into, um, <laughs> a you know, dissecting it a little more, uh, yeah. what's, are there any positives? Well, it depends how we define it. Mm -hmm. The um, globalization of the economy, which is something that I've been looking critically at for the last 45 years. There are very few benefits there in the sense that even for the winners, and we're talking now about billionaires who are, you know, going towards 100 billion and more, even their health is threatened because this type of global growth is directly linked to massive increases in emissions and therefore climate change, extinction of species, the imposition of vast monocultures in terms of farming, fishery, and forestry. And that always necessitates um, ever more chemicals because it's so unnatural. Those chemicals tend to destroy the soil, poison the water, poison our health. So, it, you know, our health is threatened, our survival is threatened. So the idea that globalization is about us being able to travel, to experience other cultures, to learn about other traditions, or to even import other foods from the other side of the world. That idea is quite a nice idea. And there's no reason why that has to be eliminated. There's no reason why people shouldn't be able to travel, why they shouldn't be able to get to know other ways, or even why they shouldn't import food or whatever from other parts of the world. What's happened is that this process of globalization has meant that our governments have been subsidizing and deregulating global business while they tax and regulate local, regional, and national business. So that's created a completely, completely imbalanced playing field. And it explains why in every country that I know of, the gap between rich and poor is growing in such an astronomical way. It's also linked to massive job insecurity and identity insecurity because we are all unique individual human beings, but we're all being subjected now to ideas that tell us that we're never good enough, that we've got to be the perfect beauty and the infinite wealth and the power of the, the people that are portrayed in the media as some kind of heroes. The idea that we should perhaps instead be looking at the wonderful joy of having more connections to, especially between older and younger people, 
um, part of this system doesn't just romanticize consumerism, it romanticizes the idea of perfection, which includes perpetual youth. So aging becomes a great drama for most people. Well, what have we done to human well-being when we make people fear, you know, growing old? That never happened in more traditional cultures. So there's a lot that we need to rethink. Um, and, and also in terms of importing foods from other side of the world, there's no reason why we shouldn't do that. But if we allow heavy subsidies for global trade to destroy local economies, then food from the other side of the world becomes cheaper than local food. And then again, what happens is global businesses become richer and richer and millions, hundreds of millions of farmers and smaller businesses go under. It's not really in our interest, but if we import and we pay the genuine price of the transport and the packaging and everything, then of course those products will be more expensive than local products. But right now around the world, the opposite is true. Mm -hmm. I know it's it's kind of uh, the, the 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 globalization seems to historically well no before I get on to that that seemingly cheap food that we are often held up as the benefit when we factor in health and environmental costs it's actually rather expensive isn't it well that is something that I think many people are aware of but I don't think they're aware of the fact that our governments are literally actively supporting this process whereby the local becomes more expensive than the global, whereby the highly processed and often unhealthy food becomes cheaper than fresh organic local food. Mm. Now, actually, with organic food, uh, we're, we're talking about not using lots of chemicals which have been produced in factories, which were you know, connected to the fossil fuel industry. We're actually talking about fewer processes. So those things would naturally be cheaper. You know, local, fresh, organic food in a natural, healthy, non-manipulated economy would be cheaper. I believe that if most people understood that, they would vote across left and right for changing government policy to make fresh, healthy food mm -hmm. reasonable for everybody. I know when it comes to environment, I was really shocked to read a few years ago the IMF report on fossil fuel subsidies, and I was having dinner with someone who was in a government position and said, oh, these renewables just wouldn't survive without subsidies. They'd be unsustainable without subsidies. I said, well, hang on. Um, in the time you and I have just been talking, I think $10 million a minute the fossil fuel industry gets every year, year on year. I mean... Yeah. Oh. Extraordinary. And, but, you know, this also what's extraordinary about that is the ignorance of the bigger yes. picture. And it's not to blame that minister or whoever he was from the government. It's just that almost no one has been charged with stepping back to look at the bigger picture and mm. to do that from a global perspective. Yes. And so to me, that's hopeful. I, you know, I feel that the main reason we're in this mess and if we're not careful, government policy is going to take us even further in the wrong direction. But it's mainly because of blindness. And I would argue blindness at the grassroots among activists as well as among government ministers. So it's, that's, I think, in a way hopeful. I do feel mm. that uh, it's more podcasts, more <laughs> ways of getting the word out that we Well, you'd be interested... Try. There are three words that I like to use, and that is collaborative, inclusive, and proactive. And I think that needs to be across the board. But I digress for a moment. Globalization and, and sort of it started really with neoliberalism, didn't it? I mean, in a way, it cut the legs out from underneath an, an emerging labor movement of the 60s and 70s and, and transferred it elsewhere. And one of the things that are held up are that we've lifted a substantial number of people out of extreme poverty. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And so there's this double-edged sword, if you like, a paradox. How do you see that when people say that to you? Well, 
I mean, first of all, I would really ask people to go back to the foundations of this modern economy, to actually go back to the 1700s okay. and look at how the, the very beginnings of this economy was about global traders from Europe mm -hmm. who gained access to resources across the world through force. Mm -hmm. So we're talking slavery, we're talking genocide. And I think it's really important that we realize if that had not been created, giant global banks and corporations would never have been as wealthy as they were by the time of the world wars. So we have a historical rise of power in the hands of global operators, you know, and even starting earlier with the Dutch East India Company and mm -hmm. so on. And all the time, it, 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 it essentially consisted of telling people it's not in your interest to maintain self-reliance. Don't try to grow everything you need. Just specialize for export. And that's a central principle of the modern economy. It's called comparative advantage that, you know, and it, on the surface, it makes sense. You know, in Scotland, if you can grow oats really well, don't bother. You know, you obviously can't grow bananas anyway. So just focus on oats and then export. Well, up to a certain point, this makes sense. But like I say, if it hadn't been for slavery and genocide, we wouldn't have a system where global traders were so powerful so that after the Second World War, when oil landed on you know, the doorsteps of these countries, not cheaply, connected to the wars, but this oil was then used to ramp up, massively ramp up what had started happening with this sort of slavery and colonialism, where huge landowners would have you know, maybe thousands of people just standing in a cotton field all day, now you had oil and then it looked like progress to say, oh yeah, let's replace those people with machinery. But in the process, even more people were driven off the land, even more massive urbanization took place and more investments, fossil fuel based investment in building up the high rise modern architecture, again, fossil fuels, cement, uh, steel and so on very energy intensive. And, you know, I came back from this ancient culture of Ladakh. I had also worked in Bhutan over several years. And as I went back to the West, you know, I came to realize that in my native country of Sweden, after the Second World War, the same basic process had taken place. More and more small farms, more and more small towns, smaller cities destroyed in favor of centralizing and urbanizing the population. So by the mid seventies, more than half of all the dwellings in Stockholm were inhabited by one person living alone because part of this process was also to create a structure where we didn't need each other because we were dependent on big distant institutions. And you had a relatively benign government in Sweden that were looking after people quite well but there was this huge unhappiness, quite a lot of alcoholism. People were lonely, separated from each other, separated from nature, and the anonymity was already an issue. Now, after the Second World War, at the same time, these political processes started taking place where a lot of idealistic people thought that if we can integrate all the economies of the world, into one global system, we won't have another world war. And we need to do this integration also to avoid another depression. But you see, what was also happening then is that corporations were being charged with figuring out how to get people to consume more and more of these mass produced, fossil fuel produced products. You know, they were actively creating consumerism and pushing it. And then, so we had actually it's not just the neoliberal economy, it's the liberal economy that, if you like, was wrong from the outset because it was never ecological. It never looked at the cost of telling people to produce monocultures instead of working with the diversity of the land. And yes, of course, some specialization is fine. And especially if that takes place between 
genuine partners and players. It's not an exploitative system with giant monopolies that then just dump farmers and, and use labor, you know, in a very exploitative way. So it's not, there's nothing inherently wrong with specialization or with trade up to a certain degree, but it becomes very wrong when it starts literally ignoring the rules of nature. And one of them is diversity. And another one is that it can only take so much pollution without starting to scream back at us, like, you know, now with climate change. But the extinction of species is just as important. Mm. And a consequence of this economy that has been out of sight, the mechanisms have been out of sight, people haven't been addressing them, they've been looking at symptoms, and in a narrow way, a lot of blame, you know, blaming the rich, blaming the right, blaming the left, but actually the systemic part has been pursued for a long time. But it did take off into this sort of, just also to say after the Second World War, what was set up was not only the World Bank and the IMF, but this process of trade treaties called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. And many people who were critical of the World Bank and the IMF didn't pay attention to these trade treaties because people generally thought trade is a good idea. They didn't really understand that it's not so much about trade between countries as it is the relationship between big business and government. So the neoliberal side of it is then a buildup because after the war, around the world, there was an attempt to protect people from the ravages of this system and to protect the environment. So we had the beginnings of the environmental movement, you know, already by the 60s. And we had before that even people insisting that government protect them from these giant monopolies. But that was then with the help of big business, big banking, not a few individuals in some dark rooms, but huge structures that were already operating like nation states. Again, very specialized and very blindly, you know, looking at their own growth as part of this. So they managed to increasingly pervert and persuade into this neoliberal project so that about 40 years after the Second World War, by the mid 80s, there was this takeoff with a big propaganda machine called globalization. Mm. That was economic globalization. And we, you know, what they were saying is to people in Australia, America, and Europe, don't complain if we move our factories to India or China or Africa. You're just being selfish. We are going to be lifting these people out of poverty. And that was all rubbish. Instead, they lifted them out of relatively secure rural livelihoods to become slave-like labor in huge factories. Yes, those Sorry, trade. This is so long. No, no, yeah. no, no. And I just there's so much there that I, as you're as you're speaking, there are things I'd want to guess. But trade agreements are another thing that is often held up, similar to growth, GDP as a measure. Trade agreements, how successful we are. Not everything they're cracked up to be, are they? No, and but I, I think it's so important that we realize that just like the average punter in the street doesn't know that. That is true of the average government minister as well. So, again, that sort of gives me hope that yeah. if we can just try to get out a bigger picture, more people will say, wait a minute. My big hope is, at the very least, that there'll be an, a, enough voices who call for a pause, you know, push the pause button. Let's examine this. There's a lot of criticism. There are reasons why we have to look at the fact that we are importing and exporting the same product. The UK is exporting 20 tons of bottled water to Australia and Australia exporting 20 tons of bottled water to UK. But not just that, it's going on a massive scale. Mm. And fish flown to China from Europe, from America, from Australia to be processed, flown back again. How can we allow that while we talk about climate change? You know, it's just insane. Mm. So we're calling it insane trade. And I think if most people would hear about that, they would be interested in understanding it better. And I believe most sane, intelligent people would say, yeah, yeah, let's push the pause button and let's really examine this and see how we can move forward in a better way. 
it's interesting though to think how that will change considering so much power is being more and more centralized and the narrative what we actually are hearing in our news services on our devices is very much being controlled by a very small proportion of, of the global population yeah. who are actually standing to benefit from controlling that narrative. Yeah. How do we change that? Well, I think the first question is, you know, the first issue is to recognize the problem. Mm. And that, again, it has not been stated clearly enough. And I don't think it's been clear enough to most of the large number of people who are devoting time because they they don't like this gap between rich and poor because they're concerned about the environment they're concerned about ill health all of those hundreds of million billions of people who are concerned and are actually taking time to do something about it have not understood the need to focus on the economy as a joint agenda as the main reason why we have such enormous social, environmental, and environmental crises now, including the pandemic. So it's really, it's happening. I feel very um, encouraged, uh, particularly because we put out this clear message about the need to strengthen local economies worldwide. And, and there's a, a huge upsurge in interest in that, particularly since COVID, but already after 2008, when it was so clear that the financial casino should not have the right to play with our lives in this way. In this way. But the fact that what was needed was regulation and that that would benefit the vast majority of people on this planet wasn't clear, you know? So we, there's a, how do we do it? We basically try to persuade more of the groups who are already focused on trying to do something to make the world a better place to focus a bit more on this. And you know, our message is, do not think you're gonna get your head around it by studying economics. We're talking about a few basic truths and principles that need to be exposed. The measurement of GDP, as you said, the trade treaties, those are the main ones, but they're also to do with what governments tax, what they subsidize and what they regulate because the trade treaties are accompanied by over-regulation at the local level. And this over-regulation at the local level gives a huge push to the right wing that says, away with government. We don't want any government interference. Let's have laissez-faire economics because they don't realize that the laissez-faire economics is not about helping them, but helping giant monopolies. So again, this few basic building blocks is what we need to look at and understand. And, and one, of those, one of those blocks is definitely the media. Hmm. The media is part of this system of enormous corporate control, and it's linked to a financial casino where money is being generated literally out of thin air. And that money, basically fictional wealth, through our ignorance, we're allowing this crazy, crazy casino to drive destruction and to prevent us from looking at the cause of the destruction on the internet, in every form of media, in science, in technology, in the universities, big money is shaping the story. So we are hoping that more and more of the small will put out the big picture as quickly as possible. And we're constantly hoping that it will trickle upwards. And it is to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this pandemic offers us many challenges, obviously, yeah. but also many opportunities to reflect. What, what, are you, what lessons do you think we've, we could learn or we are learning from this pandemic? Well, I've, for us, it's very clear because we're working quite internationally. And then when you see from so many different countries, similar statements and so on, and we, we, we decided to launch something called World Localization Day recently, uh, last year. And then this year we worked with about 70 groups on six continents. And so very clear pattern that from the grassroots, there is a demand for ways of living and doing things that are working with nature instead of against nature. 
there is a demand for restoring some kind of social cohesion and that means not accelerating this widening gap between rich and poor. And in COVID, a real hunger for community and connection was developed. And many people were also lucky enough to experience a certain rebuilding of family and community as many of the younger people came home and people lived together which is not always an easy issue, I'm very aware, but it, it was definitely, um, it definitely boosted the interest in localization, mm. for sure. However, at the same time, the retreat into isolation, the dependence on the screen is strengthening what is now the most dangerous aspect of the global economy, which is the marriage of big tech, big money and, and the war machine. And so out of this, within the war machine, the, there are published reports from the military about how they want to fuse technology and humans. And they really see this as the way forward. And now we're seeing more and more propaganda for robots. We're seeing regularly, even activists saying things like, well, human beings are just greedy and selfish and you know, just made a mess of everything. Let's hope the robots will do a better job. Now they are reiterating a message that's being put out there um, by big business that all of this mess is caused by us, that it's just human beings. We've told them about climate change and yet they're not, they're still driving around in their cars. They still wanna go, you know, on holiday and airplanes. They don't care. They don't learn from information. Now, the truth is that we have not been informed of the really efficient and systemic way of reducing emissions. We haven't had the information we need. Instead, the finger is pointed at the individual and it's made to seem as though the average person in the West is, is not only responsible for climate change and being unwilling to change their habits, but they're responsible for keeping people in the third world poor um, you know, so it's really, it's very sad that without the big picture, without look at what's actually going on, there's all this self-blame and, and more than anything, blaming human nature rather than blaming a system, which yes, many people have contributed to supporting, but they didn't create it. It's a creation, as I said, I started 500 years ago from elites who forced changes that led to this ability to amass wealth at the global level. So again, the idea of localization is let's start getting some grip on the economy. Let's the average citizen really see what, what it consists of. Let them know that GDP has become the most outrageous outrageous indicator of progress it goes up if you and i are ill chronically and have to go in and out of hospital have dialysis have constant you know pharmaceutical rate for gdp if we pollute the waters we have to buy our water and drink about them yay for gdp now that could never happen at the local level mm. if people actually saw this is how we're measuring progress it would never happen You'd have to be insane to sit there clapping your hands and call it progress when more people are ill. And when, you know. Yeah, so now one of, the, one of the books you've written is uh, From the Ground Up Rethinking, or you co-authored, uh, yeah. Rethinking Industrial Agriculture. And this program and my interest in regenerative agriculture over the last 10 years has been really uh, profound. It's had a profound impact. Um, how scalable... Well, firstly, let's rethink industrial agriculture. What is that? Tell, tell me, I mean, talking locally, but is it scalable? Because ultimately that's, that's the thing that's thrown up in, in support of globalisation, isn't it? Yeah. Well, first of all, industrial agriculture is that agriculture that came in, particularly after the Second World War with lots of fossil fuels, believing that using more and more machinery, more and more chemicals was a wonderful step of progress, alleviating people from the hardship and labor, which as I said previously had been created because of the injustice 
of very wealthy elites and corporations being able to keep you know, slave-like conditions and already land holdings that were far too big and monocultural. So when you were standing in a cotton plantation all day long, bending over, then bringing in the machinery definitely looked like progress. But what we have to look at now is that if we go back to earlier stages in our, as it were, evolution, we evolved as a human species in smaller intergenerational groups, more deeply connected to the land. And there are many examples of farming that was very successful for thousands of years. Right now, you know, you're familiar with the controversial stories about that in Australia, but I am perfectly, absolutely convinced that they did manage the land very well and they did farm. And, and, and again, from what I've experienced myself personally in more traditional cultures, including in Myanmar and you know, Mongolia and lots of places, it's clear that when people had a closer relationship with the land on which they depended, generally they managed that much, much better than distant elites or corporations that again, you know, we're imposing monoculture. So industrial agriculture is this factory way of farming. We know now what it means for animals. It's completely unnatural, the most cruel, toxic, imaginable. But with trees, with tomatoes, with avocados, it is equally uh, uh, wrong. It's torturous, it destroys the soil, it's created great dust bowls. Now what we're up against is that just as with this neoliberalism and neo-globalization, the money and the power to disseminate ideas is so humongous that we have to be so careful that we sift out ideas now so that we don't support a shift in agriculture towards even more of this madness of importing and exporting the same product, bigger and bigger monocultures. And right now, the UN will be having a food summit in September. And we in Local Futures are part of networks of groups, many of which, you know, in the collective represent hundreds of millions of farmers and people around the world who have studied agriculture from a global point of view. And they are boycotting the summit because it sounds great because there's so much language about diversity and it's bringing in lots of voices, but actually it's supporting an escalation, exacerbation of this system. Among other things, promoting robots and with the argument that people don't want to farm, but they like to be on the screen. So we give them a little screen and then they can control their robots. The robots will be so good at spraying more efficiently and effectively and They'll be linked to drones, linked to satellites to monitor carbon. And there's a lot of imposition on farmers from the climate lobby, which is mainly a corporate lobby. And reducing everything to carbon is a huge problem. It was brought in by big business as a way of creating a tradable commodity, carbon. And it's um, so from the grassroots, I also want to mention about six years ago, there was a big study called YASTAD, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. And it was actually uh, commissioned by the World Bank and the UN and several governments. So there were something like 53 uh, countries involved and involving scientists and as they worked in the global south, also farmers for three years studying this assessment of, of science and technology for, for agriculture. When the results came out, the study was squashed because it said very clearly, we cannot continue in the direction we're going now. We'll be living on a planet that will be uninhabitable. So there was a clear mandate that we need a major change, but it was squashed. And it was particularly the Anglo countries, as usual, that support this corporate path, that refuse to ratify the report. But, the, and the, you know, from the grassroots, there are also countless reports 
about how small farms actually grow the majority of food on this planet, mm. that the big are less productive. You can take any two bits of land and if you put monoculture on one, diversity on the other, you would always be able to produce much more with diversity. And the ideal way to do that is with more people. In other words, it's job rich. On a crowded planet, there's no justification now to take another huge leap towards using more energy and technology to replace people. But that's another fundament in our economy is continued support, subsidies, even including R&D and so on, that supports replacing people with technology. And right now, we should be doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of these technologies that seem so clean, you know, are actually dependent on mining, which is becoming more and more disastrous. So we, we really need to be looking at how can we, again, push the pause button, and look at the truth of what's happening and where technology makes sense, where it doesn't, but a blind rush into 5G, faster and faster, more and more competitive, fusing humans and technology. I mean, I thought it was so interesting to, to hear that Elon Musk has posed a $100 million prize for anybody who can come up with an idea for um, sequestering carbon, you know, to technologicals. And I and my response to that was, we should really get all the year seven biology students in high school to make a submission because in first year biology, we learn about photosynthesis. And I think that still is a very good way of sequestering carbon. It's not particularly technological, but it's very effective. It's been going on for millions and billions of years. That's right. That's right. Now, it's really uh, this techno fix mentality is mm. at, the, at the heart of the problem. And it was also interesting when I heard you talk about Sweden, which is a very social, social democracy. And whenever you hear anything remotely socialistic or supportive in America, um, they immediately conflate that with communism. And yet they feel very, seem to feel very comfortable with corporate socialism. Yeah, that's right. I mean, although I, I don't think that people feel that. So what's happened in America, as well as in most countries, is that the visible oppressor is seen to be big government. And this becomes very dangerous. Again, you know, as things are being regulated at the local level, people just see government coming in there, and preventing them, you know, whether as small farmers or small businesses, from actually having a, a good life. So they're not being helped to see that the much bigger problem is the big businesses that are pushing government. And they're often pushing them to bring in regulations at the local and national level, because they know that destroys their competitors. So it really is a, it's a system that both left and right would reject if they recognize it. I mean, people on the right don't believe in monopolies, they don't believe in subsidies, you know, so spelling out that the role of the big corporation is the central problem and doing it in a way that doesn't demonize individuals who work there. I think this is key. Now, there are so many people inside these corporations who really believe they're doing a good thing. Hmm. They believe we must have genetic engineering to feed the world. They do believe, you know, you were talking earlier about scaling up. You see, this is the problem, is that everybody believes that we've got to scale up to feed the world, okay. well, or that's, for yeah. even for anything to work. Mm. And you see, the truth is that when it comes to the production from nature, whether in fishery, farming, or forestry, smaller is better, more diversified is better, and then also the more intimate, more people there who will only pick the apples that are ripe and let the other ones hang on the tree till another week. The machinery for a long time now has been picking all of it. And now they may tell us, well, the robots will know the difference between ripe and not ripe, but please don't believe it structurally, it doesn't work. Because even the supermarket shelves, the machinery that washes things, the packaging, 
They all demand standard sizes. So this is one of the reasons we have mountains of really good food just burned or destroyed because it doesn't fit into an econometric model. We need to adapt the economy to the needs of nature. And that means adapt to diversity. And that's where smaller, slower, more local becomes essential. I love that. I adapt the economy to the needs of nature because one of the things I love about regenerative agriculture is that it is very much about enabling rather than dominating nature. Yeah. Yeah. And what a wonderful concept that is to yeah. enable nature. Yeah. I wonder if. Can, I, the, can, I, can yeah. I also just say something about regenerative agriculture before yes, we go please, on? Please do. And that is that it's so important because in regen agriculture, there are now, as with everything, there's this bottom up movement of people just through common sense, experience, mm. closer relationships with each other and the ground are coming up with solutions to work with nature and to work with each other in more collaborative ways to really, uh, you know, to come up with literally millions of solutions. On the other side, big business is working from the top down and they're trying to use their concepts of ecology, sustainability, diversity, and regenerative agriculture to actually keep pushing in the same direction. So to avoid that, we need to try to use more holistic language. We need to try to talk about this as a food system, not just about the soil, but how do we build food economies that work and that work for people and for nature. And the wonderful thing is with the local food movement is that you can see that it distributes wealth as well as healing the planet. And even more wonderful, it heals people, you know, as people get more engaged in that really probably archaic, deep um, side of us where we were involved in our evolution with food production, with harvesting, with processing, cooking and celebrating together over our, our, our food systems. So that is what's being recreated in the local food economy. So there we're talking about the combination of absolutely regenerating and, and restoring the soil, but also crucial is to talk about diversity, try to diversify as much as possible, avoiding monocultures. Because I just heard a talk from a UN specialist the other day where they were claiming that this sugar, these sugar plantations in Brazil that are monocultural are not actually monocultural because they were claiming that because they're being grown organically, it's okay. And there's more wildlife in there than in the forest. That's part of the propaganda to prevent us. Mm. Because once we really start diversifying, it can really only be done with markets that are closer to the farm. Ideally closer geographically, or at least of a scale and with enough time to on the ground, see what's happening. So there are some very interesting food or even herbal companies where one can trust that the, they really are checking on the soil, what's happening to the soil and the diversity on the land. Mm -hmm. But that comes through, through more intimate linkages. Big businesses, Amazon and Bezos and these giants can't do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... For regenerative, let's talk about diversified, organic food systems, localized food systems. Mm. Yes, it's interesting to see these billionaires um, uh, working out escape routes from the planet they're destroying, but that's a whole other story. Um, the, and actually, interestingly, also, I think the pandemic is reminding us that real connection with each other, yeah. there, there is no substitute. I mean, we may be wondering at how wonderful it is here. You and I are talking across Australia from on Zoom. That is wonderful. I, I appreciate that. But the connection face to face with our, our local people is, is what we're being reminded is yeah. so precious. Yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting because, again, in terms of, of physical health, 
they've discovered that when you have the symptoms of stress or um, other, you know, fatigue and so on, that talking on Zoom can be very tiring, whereas <laughs> talking face to face can be healing. Yes. It's really interesting that difference. And I think now a lot of people are feeling that, you know, they're talking about being zoomed out. Absolutely. And and I think we, we definitely need to use this technology now and use that speedy communication to get the bigger picture out. And, you know, it's using speed to be the message about the need to slow down. As a society, we need to slow down. But it's not an individual choice. It's a societal choice. And so we need to be looking at the policies and the community possibilities where we come together, not as an individual consumer, but as a member of a community and also as a voice for policy change. Yes. One of the things that we're always bombarded by negative issues, uh, images, and I think that's part of creating the angst that consumerism is the way out of that angst. Um, but I wondered, and I, and I wonder if that negative imaging about doom and gloom makes it always any discussion about the environment and puts it in the too hard basket. Perhaps we should be articulating a more positive image that people can say, wow, I want to be in that world. If you had to convey that kind of image in a short period of time, because I know you could go on, what, what does a wonderful world look like that we should all be inspiring, aspiring to? Watch our film, The Economics of Happiness. It's a, it's a world that has learned from more traditional ways of doing things to prioritize deep connection to others and to nature. It's a world in which we are not running faster and faster because of technological dictates and because top-down structures force us to do so. We're talking here now about creating different ways of, of you know, organizing ourselves economically. So we're talking about different types of jobs. So we're talking about getting away from everyone being a wage slave because things are so centralized. We're talking about people learning to develop multitude skills, so a multitude of skills so they're not so specialized. And what's wonderful is that we can point to examples in the localization movement of what happens when people start coming together in a more human scale, community way. It's happening a lot in the local food movement. Even the difference between how people feel when they shop in a farmer's market compared to a supermarket. That image right there, that experience right there, in a way, says it all. And, and, but people might not think about the different elements in the farmer's market that make it so rich. Because as I was saying earlier, I think they have something to do with a deep, archaic longing for us to reconnect to the really important thing. And that's why a farmer's market is so much more inspiring than, than other types of markets that can also be really nice, you know, with artisan production and so on. But there's something far more fundamental going on there. Another aspect is that it suits young children and old people. It's a, in, almost always in a pleasant environment, slower pace. We've done studies and found that people have 10 times more conversations in a farmer's market than they do in a supermarket. So um, that, that emblem of the farmer's market versus the supermarket, that's sort of the picture that I'm talking about. And it's a world that would be um, absolutely far more egalitarian, but not because of some top-down imposition of some enormous big government imposing it. It's a natural consequence of allowing for the more human scale interdependence in places rather than becoming dependent on distant giant businesses and systems over which we have no control. Well, Helena, I want to thank you for your inspiring work and for sharing your time. I've been so looking forward to this conversation and I love what you are doing. We will, of course, have links to your website, your books and your films. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. I hope I hope we'll stay in touch. We, we will. Can, yeah. So, thank you. Well, I have been so looking forward to talking to Helena. And as you picked up, if you're a regular listener of my, my podcast, many themes that she has was discussing there 
the themes we've touched on in various podcasts with various guests over the years. And it's perhaps now more relevant than ever. I mean, we've moved towards this high-tech, globalised world, and we've got these devices in our pockets, on our, in our laps, on our desktops, which connect us with the world. We could have thousands of friends and followers, uh, but are we connecting with the person next to us? Are we connecting with how our food is grown? Uh, do we even know how food is grown? And uh, where is it coming from? This idea that we are consuming seemingly cheap food is a theme that we've covered before. When you factor in the individual health costs and the community and societal health costs and the environmental costs, this seemingly cheap food is costing us the earth, quite literally the earth. We have an epidemic in chronic preventable degenerative diseases, which are largely the result of nutritional and environmental imbalances. That's it in a nutshell. And the food we consume is contributing to both the health of the individual or poor health of the individual and the, the crisis in the climate that we find ourselves in. Not just the loss of soils, but uh, the whole warming of the planet, the raping of the, the seas, uh, clearing out the treatment of, um, of animals in industrial agriculture. And I thought it was very interesting um, to ask uh, Helena about how she saw the um, Great Reset, this Eat Lancet report and this push towards veganism, uh, which is a follow on to the discussion I had with Professor Frederick Leroy recently as well. And, uh, and I think this is another example of well-meaning people, um, wittingly or unwittingly, uh, joining a movement which is not looking holistically. It sounds like it's holistic. You know, industrial agriculture is bad. Industrial agri animal agriculture is cruel. Therefore, we should not be consuming animals and or animal products for that matter. And as um, my all-time hero, Alan Savory, said in episode very early on, I think it's three, four or five, um, this is, it's not the resource that's the problem. It's not the meat that's the problem. It's how the meat is being managed. And uh, agriculture is not the problem. It's how agriculture is being managed. So this is all part of the same issue. Anyway, we will have links to Helena's website, Local Futures, and I would encourage you all to get on board and, and see how you can contribute to this more localised movement. And I think uh, there are so many positives there for us as individuals, as a community and as a society, not to mention the whole planet. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Early. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.